What's up guys, welcome back to Let's Play Bioshock 2! So, uh, my voice is getting better and better as the days go by, and therefore the quality of this commentary will increase as well, so... It's getting there. Well, it wouldn't be Rapture if somebody didn't just drop dead from a random hazard in the environment. Anyway, this is introducing the new alternate ammo types for Bioshock 2. These are the, uh, trap rivets, and, um... They are rivets that attach to a surface and are activated like a trip mine and do damage that way. They're not exceptionally powerful at all, so laying down several of them does help. But uh, if you're just using them to sort of detect nearby enemies, like one will go off and you'll be able to detect where an enemy is, it's useful for that. But basically these, uh, these trap type uh, weapon types and gadgets are used mainly for uh, setting up de defensive perimeters uh, for encounters later in the game, which I'll be explaining more when we get those more of those types of weapons and abilities. Um, and that's one of the key dynamics of Bioshock 2, but I can't really go into much detail about that until it's relevant. So if I didn't say so earlier, I will be showing all the storyline elements in this game as well as I did with the first one. And uh, regarding the story there, that audio diary there basically explains the fact that uh, Dr. Su Chong has uh, passed at some point between uh, the first game and now. And... Um, Gilbert Alexander there is sort of his replacement equivalent character for this game. And I, I honestly like his character better. Uh, he's easier to understand for once, and, and he has a... Not, no offense to the late Dr. Chong, but he's got a more pleasant voice to listen to, needless to say. So, um... <clears throat> here I go again. He's basically explaining, uh... how, uh... Well, he's basically talking about... Uh, eventually you'll hear him start talking about us. I'm not going to spoil anything about it, but he's basically talking about the um, the existing Big Daddies, how they are so just kind of nonchalant and they, could, they don't give half a damn about anything other than protecting the little sister, so they just kind of lumber around the environment and they don't care about anything unless they're provoked or something uh, aggroes their attention to the little sister. But you know what I mean. He goes into more detail about that later in the game. I suppose it's been a while, so Tenenbaum's got a few years on her now. Well, I gotta say, that's something Andrew Ryan never did. Turn the entire city against us. Not that the entire city wasn't already against us in the first place, but you know what I mean. <clears throat> Smart move on her part to just show our identity and be like, hey look, kill this guy. But anyway, um, this is going to be the first example of those type of defend the location from the oncoming splicers type of encounters that I was talking about earlier. <clears throat> this is the first type of example of those I can show, but not exactly the best example. Because they only have the one defensive type of weapon, which are the trap rivets. <clears throat> If I didn't say about the rivet gun in the video that we actually got it in, uh, it's basically the equivalent of a pistol from the first game as far as, like, it's semi-auto, it's the first range weapon you get, and uh, it's good for getting headshots. But, um, it doesn't have the... It, its ammo types are not really devised into anti-personnel and armor piercing anymore. It's more so, uh, you know, the uh, regular rivets, the trap rivets, and then there's a heavy rivet we get later, which I'll explain what that does when we get it. Um, but again, it's, they're not dev devised in the same types anymore, and it has a 12-round uh, a drum instead of a 6-round, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, chamber. But, um, as you can see with the telekinesis, we can still pick up corpses and, like so. Uh, getting hit headshots with this thing is actually pretty easy, but uh, I showed, um, we saw it there briefly. A uh, splicer no, toss a grenade you. out, and but that's I a good example of what I was this. talking about before, how 
the offhand grenade throwing that the splicers do can happen at complete random, and so we can. It's still a good a good idea to use the telekinesis to throw those back at them because it's a really useful way to kill them. But um, okay, sorry, uh, I was sounding terrible there. I had to clear my throat a little bit, which I still don't. I still don't sound very good, but I apologize. I, like I was saying, you can't um. Because it happens at random, you usually can't get to the telekinesis quickly enough to really act on that, unfortunately. So here introduces my favorite character in the game, Augusta Sinclair. He's basically the new Atlas equivalent for this game. And he's awesome. And if you listen to his dialogue in this upcoming level, I think you'll figure out why he's so awesome. Now we're moving on to Ryan Amusements. Which, as you guessed it, is an amusement park based on Andrew Ryan's, uh, or Ryan uh, Industries' achievements. Its greatest of which being the construction of Rapture in general. Um, anyway, like I was saying, the, the transition, the little animation that happens when you swap ammo types in this game is much more quick and smooth than the previous one. Which, uh, you know, to do the entire reload animation over again to swap ammo types in the previous game. Uh, well, in this one they made it two separate animations, which is pretty nice. But, uh, the other thing is, it's really annoying in this game. Uh, it wasn't, I don't, didn't really notice it that much in the previous game, it might not have even been true in the previous game. But, uh, you cannot swap ammo types while you're scoped in on, with, uh, the iron sights of, like, the, uh, rivet gun or something like that. You have to go out of that, uh, sight in order to swap your alternate ammo types, it won't work otherwise. And that can be infuriating in certain encounters in this game, for you need to uh, swap to an ammo type that is radically different from one another. Is progressing brilliantly. Well, it's the return of the, uh, the, the ice in this level. Speaking of ice, it's actually snowing down here in Georgia today. The first time it's done that this year. We didn't get any snow at all in 2012. Now, as I showed off on the previous enemy, the whole uh, one-two punch thing with the uh, Electro Bolt and then another attack still works really well in this game and in general. But uh, I just haven't had the liberty to really use it all that much with the uh, scarce amount of Evi pose that I've had. But as I get a bigger surplus of them and a larger um, Eve bar, then I'll continue to do them more frequently. In fact, after we get a certain item uh, later in the game, I'll be pretty much using you know one plasma, at, at least one plasma and one weapon in every uh, against every enemy we encounter at least once. Pretty much. I mean, not not flawlessly, but I'll deliberately go out of my way to attempt that. Now, Rapture's full of scientific wonderments just like you. And if we can sell them to the world at my price, well, curing your condition ought to be a cakewalk. Once we find Eleanor, the sky's the limit. Ooh. Look at that. Here's the weapons from the first game, but I'm more interested in this bad boy. That looks a little bit more to our size. But we can't get it right now. Anyway, here is one of the Power to the People stations in this game. We only have a few upgrades we can get right now. And as you can see, the ones that are not highlighted are a third um, upgrade we can get for each and every weapon after we've acquired the previous two web upgrades. And uh, just like in the previous game, when you use a Power to the People station, it becomes uh, inoperable, so we can only get one upgrade per station. The problem is with this is there is exactly enough power to the people stations in this game to account for all the upgrades you can get, but there is not enough power to the people stations in this game to account for the bonus upgrades you get. So there are, I think, two or three or maybe a few more uh, upgrades you will not be able to get in this game, where in the, uh, in the previous game you could get every upgrade. There was exactly as many power to the people stations in the first game as there were upgrades to get for your weapons. 
Such is not the case in this game, which means we have to kind of pick and choose some that we're not going to get in the long run. <clears throat> also, because we can't backtrack to previous levels we've been to, if we miss a part of the people station, we're kind of screwed. So I am not going to claim that I'm going to get all of them in this run through this game, uh, but I'm going to do my best. But either way, I have a certain priority as to which weapons I want to upgrade in which order. And uh, the first upgrade I got there was for the rivet gun. Um, to increase the damage, and the, uh, actually, do I have one I got? Yeah. Um, and then the other one will be to increase the, uh, clip size. And, um, both of which are really good, and they're, and maxing out the rivet guns upgrades actually make it really, really good. And I think that should be the first one you get. Um, the, upgrading the drill's damage is actually pretty good as well, because, uh, unlike the wrench in the previous game, the drill does not become obsolete right away. And we've got the machine gun, which is this weird, bizarre, steampunky Gatling gun, and I love the design. It looks amazing. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and demonstrate it here on these splicers by uh, shooting the crap out of them in a very chaotic and not at all accurate manner. So yeah, that went well. Yeah, the machine gun is okay, but its recoil is a bit extreme right now, kind of like the Thompson was in the previous game, except it's a bit worse here, and uh, relatively speaking. And so that's another upgrade we're going to have to get pretty soon, is to reduce the recoil in the machine gun, which we will get, but in due time. Except the problem with the, um, <clears throat> the power of the people stations in this game is... Uh, because you can't backtrack to previous to previous levels, um, if you miss one and you do another run through the game, chances are you're going to end up missing it again unless you are very, very thorough with this game and you happen to remember it very well. Because unlike the previous game, even if you're on the same run, you can't just backtrack to the level to find it so you know where to find it the next time. In, in this game, it's like if you miss it, you really didn't learn anything from missing it. So, um, there's only been one run where I've successfully gotten every single uh, Power of the People Station in this game, so hopefully I'll be able to do it again here, but I'm not going to really hold it up to myself to do that. Like I said, I'm not going to be as thorough with this game as I was with the previous one, but I still want to be as thorough as humanly possible within my uh, limitations, because I do not want to put this LP off any longer. Anyway, these little displays here actually go through the process of uh, the historical process just like a regular museum would of how Rapture was built, and it's actually pretty fascinating. So, um, definitely take the time to watch all those. I'm only going to demonstrate that one, and then I'll leave that up to you to uh, watch all the others. I'm not going to waste my time with it if you're just going to watch them over again, playing the game. Now, uh, as for the getting the blue bonuses and hacking like this, one thing I actually highly recommend doing is hacking the uh, healing stations like that because the uh, the drop you get from the blue bonus is a health kit. So early on in the game like this, when hacking is easy, definitely take advantage of that to get some extra health kits. And uh, then you can break it for an additional health kit. So um, in the previous game, when hacking health stations was not that crucial, but you just sort of did it if you wanted to prevent splicers from being able to heal themselves with it. And you would do it for that reason, but in this game, it's even more beneficial because not only can you prevent uh, Spicer from, from being able to heal themselves from it, but you could also uh, get a free health kit from it. But uh, the real reason for hacking the health stations is to make them cheaper, but I never really use them anyway because I'd rather have the health be portable with the, uh, the health pack, so I'd rather just break it and get the health pack. To be perfectly honest, so there's a lot of the health stations later in the game, as in this game especially compared to the previous one, where I'm just going to be breaking the damn things and getting the health back. Once again, guys, I know I must sound horrible in this recording, but I'm doing my best here, so it'll only get better in the days to come. So Eleanor has given us a little gift through the other little sisters by ordering them what to do, essentially. Um, and she's provided us with this nice little audio diary of hers that is going to uh, give us some fond memories of her childhood past before we knew her as a proper little girl instead of a hideous monster. Anyway, I kid, I kid. Um, the 
tonic that she gives us, though, is a uh, combat tonic called um, the Drill Power, which is the first of the drill upgrades we can get. We can equip If we equip that and the, uh, we get the drill damage increase at the Power of the People station, uh, the drill becomes quite powerful. Um, that combined with an attack we get later in the game, the drill will be good for pretty much the rest of the game, um, which is a nice relief. So we're going to have a fight with the Big Daddy coming up here soon, so I want to go ahead and hack this so I can use it during the fight if necessary. Damn it. I fucked up and got an alarm set off. There we go. Anyway, um... And darn it again. I think it's... Yeah, this is the first time I died, so... Anyway, um, I like in the previous game we get revived at Vita Chamber, so, um... We don't have to really do anything to the Vita Chamber, it's automatic. I guess we just have to be in the vicinity of one. We don't even have to look at it, and it will revive us anyway, so. Um, but hopefully, I will try to die as little as possible, even though death does not really have much of a penalty in this game, unfortunately. That doesn't make the game easy by any means, really, um, because you can die multiple, multiple times in the same encounter and just keep consuming your stuff over and over again. But, um... And there's a, there is a way to shut them off if you actually want to make the game genuinely challenging, uh, which I have done several times for this game. But I figured I wouldn't do that for this run, for the uh, convenience of the recording and everything, in case I did somehow die.